Good morning, Bridge, and welcome. As we continue to talk about Jesus, meet Jesus, and we are going to be in this, in this series all the way uh, through Resurrection Sunday. Why don't you pray with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, O God, that you are God and that you have loved us so much that you would give your only begotten Son so that whoever believes in him would have eternal life. We are so grateful for that. Oh God, we ask that you would be with us today as we open up your word, that you would speak to our hearts, speak to my heart, speak, oh God, to our lives, oh God, and allow us to be transformed by your word. I confess that I am nothing, oh God, before your people. I am nothing before you, oh God. If there's anything good in me, it is because of you. So hide me now behind the shadow of the cross in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we are going to just examine just for a little bit the concept of Jesus as a compassionate physician. Turn with me to Mark, the second chapter, and we are going to be reading verses 15 through 17. It says, while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, Many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but, but sinners. So we read this passage, and the whole idea is to see or to contemplate Jesus as a compassionate physician. But when we hear the word physician, or we hear the, the word doctor, undoubtedly we're thinking about physical illness. And certainly that's the connotation, but it is so much more than that. It is so much more than that because God sees just about all of our perils as some form of illness. Even this idea that there is, there, there is no good, no one who's righteous, no one who follows under, a, a, a behind God or who follows God is a type of illness. If you look in, in, in certain passages in Scripture, for instance, let's go to Psalms, the 14th chapter. Verse 1 says, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. Ecclesiastes 7, 20 to 22 says, Indeed, there is no one on earth who is righteous, no one who does what is right and never sins. Do not pay attention to every word people say, or you will hear your servant cursing you. For you know in your heart that many times you yourself have cursed others. So it's not just even a matter of you not, you know, people not doing right by you. You don't do right by people either. It's, 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 an, it's a vicious, never-ending cycle. Look at Romans 3.10. The apostle says, as it is, it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. And when I think about how we complain about who stole what from me, who did not speak to me, who did not return my lawnmower, who did not, you know, who, who made an evil eye at me. And, and, we, and we are so indignant when people offend us 
as if we have never offended anybody else. And the Bible is, is, is clear that there is no one good. And not only that there's no one good, but we tend to think we are good people. You ask the stranger in the street, like, are you a good person? Yeah, I consider myself uh, a good person. And the reason why people consider themselves a good person is because they are, they are comparing themselves to the serial killer that's on the 5 o'clock news. So basically, compared to the serial killer, I, I am a good person. When actuality against the moral code of God, we are all depraved and we are all just as lost as the serial killer. At the end of the day, the repayment that people get for their sins is not like Delta, that you can buy a ticket to go somewhere and, 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 and get you know, first class or comfort or economy. There are no such things in hell. There are no degrees of heart based on whether you just lied or you molested 50 children. But sometimes we act like that. And all of that is sickness. All of it. This is to say, we all need a doctor. We all need a savior. To cure us from what? To save us from what? Well, from everything. Everything from, from the illnesses that we have from day to day to the sickness of the mind and the sickness of the soul, all of it is, is, is illness. And that's the reason why we need this great physician that cures us from our diseases. And this very act of curing or delivering or saving us brings glory and honor to his name. Consider Psalms 50, 15, that says, Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. So the whole point, that God delivers you, and your deliverance causes you to glorify him. You know, in, in, in biblical days, sickness was viewed as evidence that you must have done something horrible. Like, like that's the reason why you are, you are sick. And honestly, that, that happens today too. I heard the story of a, a young woman, a friend of mine actually. So this is, this is firsthand account. A young woman who was sick in the hospital. She had a heart condition that threatened to take her out. As a matter of fact, if it wasn't for a family that just refused, doctors would have just given up on her. And her pastor went to visit her. But instead of attempting to provide comfort or even pray for the healing, he began to accuse her of being disobedient. In the middle of her deathbed. Accuse her of being disobedient and that, he had, that she had brought this condition on herself and that she was to blame. When I heard this, I was appalled, especially when I found out what exactly the pastor wanted her to do. He just wanted her to do his bidding, which is not what God had in store for her. But he was not comforting at all in those situations. And it, it reminds me of Job. Remember when Job got afflicted and all his friends came to see him? And, I, and, and they came to comfort him. And they sat with him in silence for a while. And they should have just stayed quiet. That was like the best comfort. And, 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 and it, is a, it is a lesson for all of us, Okay. When you don't know what's going on, just come, show up, shut up, and just sit with the person. Whoever is, is suffering, whoever has lost someone, I, I want you to understand something. 
very, very carefully, okay? It doesn't matter how pious of a Christian you are. When somebody really close to you dies, the last thing you want to hear from somebody else is they're in a better place, honey. I don't want to hear that. Even if it's true, that's not something you want to hear because that better place for them still means I am without them. Oh, you'll see them again in heaven. When I get to heaven, I won't need them. I need them now. So sometimes the compassionate thing to do is just sit with them. They are sick with a, with a horrible disease. Let's pray for healing or what? Or just sit with them and hold their hand. But this is not what Job's, Job's friends did. The assumption is you must have done something to deserve this. And the same thing happened. Similar story takes place in the ninth chapter of John. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? Somebody must have done something wrong. As if you don't live in a world that it is so fallen that sickness falls upon us all. Someday or another, at some point or another. These guys, just like my friend's pastor, assume that someone must have sinned, but Jesus tells them that it was not a specific sin that was responsible for this man's blindness, but that he had been chosen by God to display the glory or the works of God. And in many instances, that's what sickness is. An opportunity for God to display his glory. Now I preach to the glory of God. Joseph plays to the glory of God. These camera operators, they do so to the glory of God. Jamie sings to the glory of God. Who would like to be blind to the glory of God? What's tougher, the condition or the knowledge that it was God's idea? Do you trust them that much? Jesus spat on the ground and made some mud with his saliva. He put it on the man's eyes. It doesn't get nastier than this. Put it on the man's eyes and told him to go, to go wash it off. You know, I, people love Jesus for so many different reasons. There is one particular reason, and I love him for all those reasons, but there is one particular reason that really attracts me to Jesus is the drama. The dramatic way, because it would have been very easy to just speak the words, but no, let's, let's make this dramatic, shall we? Oh, oh. And grab the mud. I know, right? Once I say it like that, it sounds like, oh, this is really disgusting, but I bet you it got everybody's attention. To the glory of God. As soon as the man went and, and washed off his, his, <laughs> his face, the Bible says that he could see. John 9, 8 says his neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said he was, and others said, no, he just looks like him. But the beggar kept saying, yes, I am the same one. They asked, who healed you? What happened? And he told them, the man they called Jesus made mud and spread it over my eyes. And, and you know, that's so funny. He didn't tell them how he made the mud. That, that's so funny. I, didn't, I just noticed that. He made mud and spread it over my eyes and told me, go to the pool of, of Siloam and wash yourself. So I went and washed, and now I can see. Where is he now? They asked. I don't know. He replied. 
But notice, nobody celebrated with him. This was a big deal. He was born blind. He did not regain his sight after a, a, you know, a lapse with blindness. He was born this way. And the fact that his brain could even process things he had never seen before is a miracle. Do you know why babies or toddlers bump into stuff? It's not because they don't see them. They can see them, but they have no, no depth perception. They have no idea how close something is. You have to learn that. It takes a moment for your brain to figure out, okay, it, okay. just teaching your teenager how to drive. They see the stop sign and they stop about 200 feet. They have no concept of perception of how far it is. It takes a moment. So the fact that, that Jesus not only healed the man, but the man knew what he was seeing when he has never seen before was a miracle. But nobody wanted to celebrate with him. Nobody celebrated with him. They, they and the Pharisees were, the, the, the people that were asking questions and the Pharisees were more concerned with the healing happening on their precious Sabbath. More concerned over uh, the technicality of a, of a rule being broken than the fact that a man that was born blind could suddenly see. Not even his parents expressed gratitude. Look at verse 19. Is this your son? They asked. Is this the one you said was born blind? How is it that he can now see? Well, we know he's our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind, but, but how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him. He's of age and he can speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. So these parents were more concerned with their social status than the fact that their son could now see. So the man was summoned again by the religious authorities. Look at verse 24. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. And this is what they said to him. Give glory to God by telling the truth. Oh, he's about to. We know this man is a sinner. And he replied, oh, his words are beautiful. He said, he replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered, I have already told you, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? This is when he got indignant. Do you want to become his disciples too? Yeah, that one was going to cause him. <laughs> that one was going to cause him something. Verse 28, then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this man, so this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we do not even know where he comes from. Verse 30, the man answered, oh, this is precious too. Now that's remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could not do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth how dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Oh, I wish I had been a fly on the wall. Talk about drama. But now this, the guy is an outcast because he can't see. Being blind, 
Please understand, there was no welfare. The government was not going to put out, there was no food stamps for him. He could not take care of himself. He was, a bur he was not even a burden to society because society was not going to take care of him. So he sat and he begged for money. So he was an outcast. Now he can see, he can fend for himself, he can be a productive member of society, and society now rejects him because he can see. And this is what Jesus means when he says that he's the physician. The, 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 the um, passage that we read at the very beginning, it talks about him sitting with tax collectors and sinners. And yet he says, it's, it's not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. Which means that the context was different. There was nothing there about anybody being sick. So even though Jesus cured this man's blindness, he's not done with him yet because he's still sick. He may not have blindness, but he has another illness. The Bible says that when Jesus found him, when Jesus found out that they threw him out, he com the compassionate physician fulfilled yet another role. Cast out from his social identity, Jesus gave him another social identity by revealing to him who he was. And Jesus revealed to him, to this man, the majesty of who he was, something that nobody else in the crowd knew. Only his disciples were privy to this, 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 this awesome news. And according to the scriptures, the man fell on his knees and worshipped him. So he gave him glory. He is the compassionate physician. Not only would he take care of your physical needs to the glory of God, but even the stuff that happens after. Not only would he take care of your, of your emotional needs, but even the stuff that happens after. Not only would he take care of your mental, your spiritual needs, but he will take care of the stuff that happens after. As I was thinking about Jesus as the compassionate physician, a song came to me. It's an, it's an old country gospel song. These are the words. It says, I was working in town one afternoon, attending some business affairs. I heard a commotion a couple of streets over and wonder what's happening there. A young man was running in that direction and stopped just to catch his breath. I asked him to please tell me what was the hurry. He smiled at me and he said, I was trying to catch the crippled man. Did he run past this way? He was rushing home to tell everyone what Jesus did today. And the mute man was telling myself and the deaf girl he's leaving to answer God's call. It's hard to believe, but if you don't trust me, ask the blind man, he saw it all. Go ask the blind man, because he saw it all. So my friend, if the troubles and burdens you carry are heavy and dragging you down, you've tried everything you can possibly think of. There's no relief to be found. That very same Jesus that altered the future of a blind man, the deaf and the lame, is still reaching out in your hour of trouble. One touch and you're never the same. You'll be trying to catch the crippled man did he run past this way? He was rushing home to tell everyone what Jesus did today. 
And the mute man was telling myself and the deaf girl, he's leaving to answer God's call. It's hard to believe, but if you don't trust me, ask the blind man, because he saw it all. This is Jesus. Meet Jesus, the compassionate physician, as the praise team comes. If you are like the Apostle Paul, and you are plagued with some infirmity or some suffering for which the Lord's reply to you is that his grace is sufficient. Know that the ultimate healing is guaranteed later when God turns the grave into a womb, giving birth to your new glorified body. In the meantime, let God sustain you and deliver you and heal you day by day. Songwriter says, come out of sadness from wherever you've been. Come brokenhearted, let rescue begin. Come find your mercy, O sinner, come kneel. Earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot heal. I don't know where you find yourself today. And I don't know what pain may be grappling your, your body. And you may be suffering deeply. But I am here to tell you that there is one that can heal. And it is perhaps that your sickness and your illness, your illness is, is designed to bring glory to God. And I'm going to tell you, in no way my preaching gives more glory to God than your illness. In no way their singing gives more glory to God than your suffering. Jesus who knows what you bear will never put more on you than you can actually take. And one day when the last song is sang, and the last sermon is preached, you will be able to give glory to God for every infirmity you ever had because it brought you to Him. In Jesus' name, bear it and take comfort that the healer knows you by name.